All right, so that was a look at the daily interbank forex rates. But uh, just to tell you that the rates will be much higher if you visited the forex bureau or the retail market. The pound going for as high as 10 cities, 28 pesos. We want to begin with the city uh, this afternoon. The city lost a little over 7% in value to the U.S. dollar last month, taking the year-to-date depreciation to 20.5%. This is high. Uh, this is due to the high demand for the U.S. currency, coupled with other factors. The rising demand for the dollar, which is about four times that of supply, is expected to push inflation up. Dr. Benjamin Amwa is a senior finance lecturer at the University of Ghana Business School, also executive director of the Center for Economics, Finance and Inequality Studies Surface. He joins us to make sense of the performance of the local currency. And uh, thanks for joining us, uh, Doc. I need our audience to understand what the problem is. High demand for the dollar, far exceeding supply. How is that causing the city to depreciate? Okay. Thank you. This is what we, we know in market-led economics where the demand and supply conditions is what fix the price. So in a, a managed float system like we have in our country, we expect that market forces will definitely influence the price of how much CD we have to sell to get a dollar. So basically, that is the, the, the foundation on which the argument is based. Again, what is now driving the, the dollar? This is that if you have observed the U.S. Fed behavior, there's a deliberate attempt to increase interest rates in the U.S. And externally, there's a lot of interest now in U.S. dollar-denominated assets. And that is what is globally pushing the demand for dollars up in addition to increases in oil prices. So countries that are import-led would then have to suffer the, the difficulties of getting the U.S. dollar and by extension will have to sell more of their local currency to get the U.S. dollar. Hence, the current depreciation that we are seeing from the Ghana City point of view. And how worrying is this, especially when we are trying to curb imported inflation? It is worrying because structurally we have done very little to, to substitute most of the items we consume as a country. And until we look at that medium to long term solution, there is very little that the Bank of Ghana can do. Because from the monetary point of view, in the money flow system, from time to time, Bank of Ghana must come in to support the currency. And we have seen this happening time and time again. Mm. It is simply because our insatiable demand for the dollar cannot, like you rightly said, at all point in time be met by Bank of Ghana. So we need to look at the, the physical regime that we are running that puts excessive pressure on the need for, for dollar. If we can address it from that point of view, then the pressure on BOG to constantly supply and support the CD, the US dollar, will greatly be reduced. Until we do that, Look, there's very little that BOG can do because BOG doesn't control the physical aspect of the economy. All that they have to do is just come in and support. And if you watch, when they pump in 100, 200 million dollars, the CD stabilizes for about one, two weeks, and then just a week after that, realize that the CD becomes a bit weak again. So it means that there is more to it than the short term approach that we are using. We need to look at the medium term and the long term. And the medium and long term, we have to look at how best we can fix up the physical regime we have where we'll do more of import substitution than just to be importing. And that leads me to my next point. You talk about uh, the short-term measures not working. And, and so I, I'm just asking, have we lost control? No, we, we, are, we are not lost control at all. The managers of the economy are still doing what they can to help the situation. Uh, it, it's just that sometimes the forces that come across external forces put that pressure on us. We have not. What we need to do is to look at our homegrown policies and then in the medium to long term, make sure that they can give us a perfect substitute. That is what we are failing to do. And until we do that, we will not lose control, but we will have the difficulty in having the currency depreciation within our reach. So you're saying in the short term, there is no respite? In the short term, BOG can come in gradually to support. But this is not the first time BOG has been supporting. So if you are looking at what has happened in the past with BOG support, 
are using that to predict, then what we are saying is that in the next two, three months, we'll be here having the same discussion because it is not just about BOG. It goes beyond BOG. You know, the demand for the U.S. dollar goes beyond BOG. So we need to not just put the blame or the responsibility on BOG alone. We need to look at what aside BOG can we do? And that is the import aspect. Mm. If it is about trade, BOG does not directly deal with trade. If it's about import substitution, BOG directly does not do that. They just provide the means of effecting the payment, which is the currency. So we need to look at what we are consuming that we can produce locally. And that is what I think we are failing to do. So BOG will do all they can. But then the impact of what they can is just like what we are seeing now. All right, we are switching topics uh, to talk about the electronic transaction levy, uh, the implementation so far. And to this news, uh, we reported today uh, that revenue growth from MTN's mobile business was impacted negatively by uh, the tax on electronic transactions, according to uh, the telecom giant's 2022 half-year uh, financial statement. I'm sure other telcos will have similar report. No surprises there, I guess, Prof. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, uh, during the implementation and before the implementation, there were a lot of surveys that came out to show that no, the response of mobile money consumers was just not as optimistic and as ambitious as the policymakers wanted to make wanted to make us believe. So it is not at all surprising. Uh, this is simply a consumption tax, and there's an easy way to avoid consumption tax do not consume the product. And that is what the consumers of Momo and electronic fund transfer have simply displayed. And so the over almost 90% you know, of the target uh, achievement is not surprising to some of us. Mm. Accounting and auditing firm PwC is calling for a review of the rate to not more than 0.75%. Their reason is government adjusted the e-levy revenue target by over 91% from 6.9 billion cities to 600 million. And in the three months after its implementation, we just uh, made 10% of that. So it just makes sense that we review. Your thoughts? Yeah, the review is in order. The review is absolutely in order. And the expectation is that as the rate is reduced, uh, we'll get a lot more consumers to consume and make use of e-levy. But then again, in the mind of the policymaker, is it going to be a simple comeback for the consumer? And so if you call for review, that is okay, but you need to work out the numbers, simulate the numbers and see what the likely behavioral response will be. Mm. And if even in actual fact, the 0.75% the is what will draw uh, you know, most of the consumers back. From where I'm sitting, I think that Anything between 0.25 and 0.5 is what will, will likely do the trick for, for the ministry. But then again, we have to be careful because if you, it's a behavioral thing, if you even reduce it to 0.25, and it happens that, you know, the response is not as what was anticipated, then it means that you have lost from that point of view. But again, you can gain by looking at it from the fact that once you reduce it to that level, chances are that a lot more people will come in, the digital economy will pick up, and then you can do the direct taxation of the digital economy to sort up or to supplement what you may have lost or you stand to lose out by reducing your e-levy from the current 1.5 to anything below the 0 0.75 that we are proposing to the state. But I must confess, it's not an easy thing to do. A lot of simulation must go behind the yeah. scenes before I believe that the policymakers can come to a conclusion on the appropriate rate to go for. And, and on 0 0.25, that's asking too much. Well, last week, my colleague, uh, George Yaffe, asked the finance minister, Ken Oferiata, if government would consider scrapping the tax totally. I want us to listen together to the response from the finance minister. So no, no, we, we have to pursue it because it's an important tax handle um, that will enable all of us to contribute in one fell swoop and has the capacity of a compliance once the leakages and exemptions are taken care of. 
um, that then brings in the type of resources that we need. George, nobody likes to pay taxes. And when it comes to a tax system that you may not be able to dodge you know, or avoid, uh, it becomes, you know, a little intimidating. Or you might feel that the coerciveness of the state. Uh, but truly, the country has to be run with taxes. What are the important tax handles that you can have? And I, I believe that e-levy is one of them um, going forward. The country is going to continue to be digitalized. Use of currency is going to be minimized or minimized over time. Uh, and so this is what then will capture all of us in a bucket uh, in which we can then develop and transform our country. But mobilization is not doing well. I mean, you did a projection and in right. terms of collection is not doing well. Do you That's think correct. that that should influence any adjustment going forward? Um, adjustment, I mean, in the sense of um, um, the assumptions that we gave, um, to really look at them and, um, and really um, eliminate, you know, as many of the assumptions as possible, in line with our assumptions bill that has now, you know, been passed by Parliament. Um, and that's key. I mean, we, we need to get all of us contributing to it. Uh, and once we do that, that we should be able to move this transformation agenda forward. There's calls to also look at the rate as well. Is that something that will be on the table? We looked at the rate at the beginning, went through the country, brought it down to 1.5. Now let's look at the assumptions first, mm -hmm. and then we will then titrate if anything else has to be done. 0.5? I don't know where the number I emanated from, but everybody seems to have it on their lips. Yeah. Um, no, I think the key issue is really the issue of merchant to merchant, paying through Ghana.gov, agent to agent, uh, the, the, the banking systems, exemptions, etc. Uh, once that is thoroughly examined and we can figure out um, exactly what we can get from that, then we can look at other so um, at least we know the government stands on all of this right now. The finance minister says, no way, we are not going to scrap the tax. We are going to consider some exemptions. Your reaction to this? Yeah, it, it, it's a good thing not to, not to scrap it because at least half a loaf is better than none. So you need to keep it. But then the issue is when you look at the exemptions again, how much will the exemptions contribute to what you're already getting? Remember, initially it was 1.75 with an anticipated revenue of $6.8 billion. Then there was a much talk about it, and it was reduced to $1.5 in terms of the rate with the exemptions. And then we had an anticipated revenue of $4.5 billion. Now, if you are going to reintroduce some of the exemptions, are we saying that the over 90% below the target achievement, these exemptions will trigger, and we are going to have almost about 80% Revenue mobilization, the answer is no. The answer is absolutely no. There's no magic wand that will turn around these exemptions that will give us a near 4.5 billion. So clearly, there's something that has to be done about the E levy. Okay. Taking it out is not the best way to go, no, because at least it's giving us some revenue. But then we need to think about how best we can get a lot more people to make use of the digital money space. And then right. build the digital economy so that we can get the tax, the direct tax from that point to sort out what we have failed to rake in as a result of the e levy that is not fetching us so much. If we can do that, fine. But to use the exemptions as a reason to sort it up, I, I'm sorry, I don't think we are going to get anywhere near half of the anticipated amount, even if we re look the exemptions that we give on the e levy. Okay. Executive Director of Surface, Senior Finance Lecturer at the University of Ghana Business School, Dr. Benjamin Amwa, appreciate your thoughts this afternoon. Well, next, a desperate call for help. Liquefied petroleum gas consumers are bearing the brunt of the strike by tanker drivers and marketers. They simply cannot find LPG to buy. The two groups are raising a litany of issues, including the continuous freeze on operations of some stations following the atomic junction gas explosion five years ago. They want government to lift the ban immediately. Gabriel Kumi is vice president of the LPG Marketers Association. Main issue bordering and confronting all these associations is the $10 million that our members have sunk on the ground. 
in the name of constructing LPG stations that a ban has been placed on for the past five years. We are not able to, re to finish these projects and, and recoup the investment made in them so we can repay uh, the, the loans we've taken from the bank. We had been given various permits over the years and we have started construction and we have sunk a lot of uh, borrowed funds into these projects. So allow us to complete those ones so that if you issue instruction to MPA to say that, look, from today, don't issue any new permit to anybody to construct LPG station in Ghana. We go by that. But those that we have been given permit by fire, fire permit, EPA permit, MPA no objection uh, permit, MPA construction permit, and all that, and we have begun construction. Please give us that leeway so that we'll be able to construct those stations so we can recoup the investment and repay our loans to the bank. And my brother, we've been fighting this for five good years. We don't seem to achieve any results. For a businessman in this era of COVID-19 and, and, and Russia, Ukraine war, in this difficult time for a businessman to wake up in the morning and say, I'm locking up my, my business, that fits me. It tells you that something big is chasing that person. And that is where we've got into now. We didn't have to get here. We have written letters to the ministries, to, to, to MPA, and even to cabinet to consider indigenous Ghanaians who have invested $10 million on the ground. Where is our support for the private sector that we always talk about? LPG is the only industry in Ghana that has 100% local content in terms of participation. The LPG downstream is 100%. Now in, in Ghana, even Kelewele selling and Bayayachi is being taken over by Chinese. We cannot go to cabinet to spill our, our grievances. We can only do that through our regulator like MPA and then through the ministry. If these people are presented what they need to present and it's not being adhered to, maybe government is not, is not, is not, is not uh, understanding the magnitude of the situation. So maybe such actions, uh, when the, the general public began to speak, government will listen to us. So what do you think is causing the reluctance on the part of cabinet to listen? Your guess, I, I don't know. I can't tell. I can't tell that you have your indigents. You have a local industry like the LPG downstream industry made up of indigenous Ghanaians, 100%. The LPG industry in Ghana has been built by indigenous Ghanaians. When we started the LPG in Ghana, the foreign companies like the Totals and the Shells were involved. They all chickened out because of the sensitive nature of the product, because of the difficulty in trying to market and distribute that product. It took the ordinary Ghanaian to stand tall, and we have built the industry over the past 25 years to where it is today. So why, as to why cabinet doesn't want to we, we understand gov government wants to introduce a new policy, cylinder recirculation policy. That is why all these things is going on. But you don't destroy your existing industry just because you have the intention of introducing a new one. How sure are you the new one you are going to introduce will, will succeed or will fail? You have a bed in hand. You have a, an industry that employs about 7,000 direct labor, 7,000 Ghanaians. So even if you have an intention to introduce a new one, must you destroy the existing one? Now consumption of LPG is on the decline. So when are you reopening the stations? It's an indefinite strike that we have been backed on. Not until we, see, we, we, we get something positive from, this is a legitimate demand. I'm sure you are convinced, that you, the way you are nodding, you've convinced that we are making a very legitimate demand. An indefinite strike. Uh, well, so the strike by the gas tanker drivers uh, enters day two. And as we have been reporting, LPG outlets have also closed down in solidarity with the drivers who are asking for improved uh, working conditions and also joining calls for the directive against construction of new stations to be reviewed. The National Petroleum Authority and Energy Ministry are hoping to meet uh, the two groups after they fail to attend an initial meeting for a resolution. Mohamed Abdul Kudus is communications manager at the MPA. We are working at them to get them to the table. Because if you're not able to get them to the table, 
solution is going to really be difficult to arrive at. So that's why we're urging that. Let's get to the table. You see, there are competing interests that inform the decisions that are taken ultimately. It is not just one of the interests. So if you decide that somebody has spoken and has called for the, 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 the lifting of the ban on the, the construction, then the next moment you see people then start to also to strike and say that we don't want this realization at this place. We don't want it at that particular place. So we need to marry all of the competing needs and be able to al- arrive at a long-lasting solution than to hit one only to be confronted by the other because of the agency that we are attached to them, minded by the consequences of uh, uh, the non-supply of the product. That's why we didn't even wait for the um, strike to start on Monday. Immediately we heard the alarm bells being uh, uh, rung as of Friday. As of Sunday, we sent notices. Now look, we are partners in this industry. These are issues that you are bringing. Come to the table, let's discuss them. Like I said, uh, for some want of one inconvenience or the other, they were not able to make it up to the meeting. We're hoping that we'll do it as soon as possible. Well, while we are with the outcome of that meeting by the MP and the Energy Ministry with the LPG marketers and the gas tanker drivers, we are hearing of new developments. We are hearing that the strike has been escalated to include all fuel tanker drivers. Uh, my colleague James Ishen is following that for us. He joins us on phone. Uh, what can you report, James? Right, so Darry, we are in day two of the sit-down strike for the the National Tank uh, um, Drivers Association. And we understand from some sources within the drivers um, indicating that um, they are still not willing to sell the, um, the LPG to any customer who would want to come around to get one. And I also understand that the LPG outlets uh, also basically are turning down drivers and other patrons. And the new developments we are getting is they've intensified their activity by also asking other drivers who transport various petroleum products to the various filling stations, whether gas or diesel or petrol, they are also they've also asked them to halt operations. So that's the new development we are getting from some of the um, LPG and um, that is the Gas Tanker Drivers Association. All right, uh, James Ishan, thanks for bringing us up to speed. We'll keep following uh, the latest that. Uh, Fuel, other fuel tanker drivers are being asked to join in the strike by the gas tanker drivers. Before we go, the ARB Apex Bank says it is positive many rural banks will recover from the reeling economy as a number of banks have already made significant profits. However, the rural banks are worried about the rising inflation due to government's failure to support local production. Chairman of the Board of Directors for the Association, Dr. Anthony Kwesi Orbin, was speaking at the 20th Annual General Meeting in, uh, in Kumasi. Global economic growth as projected by the IMF is expected to plummet from 5.9% to 4.4% in 2022, stemming largely from the Russia-Ukraine war. Ghana continues to reel from the exacerbating impacts of the war, affecting the performance of banking industries, including rural banks. With gradual recovery from the pandemic, the rural banking industry recorded marginal improvements with deposits growing by 11.5% from 5.3 to 5.9 billion Ghana cities in 2021. Despite some temporal losses incurred at the last quarter of 2021, the Association of Rural Banks says they are well positioned to recover from the impact of the war compounded by the COVID-19-related bottlenecks. Dr. Anthony Aubin is the chairman of the board of directors for the ARB Apex Bank. During the pandemic, that is where most of the rural banks were increasing their deposits. You see, if you apply the right strategy, you know the people in the rural areas. And I must also say that the rural banks have more customers than any other bank in Ghana. Our customer base is about 6.5 million uh, Ghanaians. So, so we are a force to reckon with when it comes to the mobilization of small funds uh, from our, 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 our unbanked communities in the rural areas. So yes, from the book, we made some losses, but I mean, we know for now that we are, you know, in the profit-making 
zone now. The region Russian war has heightened uncertainty in global outlook with a spike in crude oil prices and elevated inflation expectations. The Apex Bank for the Rural Banking Industry is admonishing the government to invest in local production to avoid devastating impacts of external shocks on the economy. Ghana imports almost everything, including toothpicks. So if the price of uh, uh, toothpicks go up, you, 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 the burden falls on you here in this country. And then of course, if you are not producing anything, that, that's also a, a, a cause. And the general price build up, if there's a, a general price build up in the country, especially the product, and we don't have strong productive sectors, that is a, the source of uh, 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 inflationary pressures that we face. And that's our program this afternoon. There is more news on our website, myjoyonline.com forward slash business. More there for you to read, myjoyonline.com forward slash business. My name is Daryl Kwa. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.